Radio.com. And what is up, Man Hour Nation? The after show is here. Live, raw, uncut sports talk after hours feel 10 p.m. East Coast time every Tuesday and Friday. Normally, Hoffy will be joining me, but tonight he's having a little bit of malfunction on the computer side. So, guys, it's just going to be us. We are, excuse me, we are just going to be hanging out, having a grand old time, talking about whatever you guys want. I have posted a link. I posted a link in the chat here. If you guys are wanting to, you know, join the chat here, feel free to jump in there. Click that link and join that chat, and we are going to have a civilized conversation. We can talk about anything and everything that you guys are wanting to talk about. So, obviously, the rosters have been trimmed down. The rosters have been trimmed down from 96 to 93 to 60 and now down to 53-man roster. There's been a lot of changes. There's been a lot of moves. But one move that has strictly surprised the living crap out of me is what is happening in New England. New England decided to cut... Everybody, what's up, Drew? I see you. New England decided to cut every quarterback that they had besides my man, Mac Jones. They said, Bailey Zappi, get out of town. They said, Malik Cunningham, get out of town. They literally only have one quarterback on the roster one quarterback on the roster so this got me thinking this got me pondering thoughts in the old noggin of my beautiful head what are they going to do in the quarterback room in new england obviously mac jones is the guy They obviously are all in on Mac Jones. No question about it. But think about this. The Dallas Cowboys have four, that's right, four quarterbacks on their roster right now. One of them being the one and only Trey Lance. So when we think about this and we wrap our heads around this, are the New England Patriots willing to part with a fourth-round pick, a third-round pick, maybe some type of other capital for a player like Trey Lance to run their backup squad on the backup QB, QB2? Guys, let me know in the chat below. 
let me know. Do you think New England Patriots made a mistake by cutting every quarterback on their roster except Mac Jones? Did they make a mistake by letting Bailey Zappi walk away? Former fourth round pick I might had heading into his second year. Started a couple games last year for the New England Patriots. Let's, let's not forget about that. Let's not forget about that. People were screaming for Bailey Zappi to start. I guess anytime there's a little bit of controversy happening in New England, cut it off at the head. Cut it off at the head. Tom Brady, right? Obviously there for many, many years. They drafted many quarterbacks. But once, that's right, once Jimmy G started to make a little bit of headway. Hell, when Matt Castle started to make a little bit of headway, cut the stink off at his head. Get him out of town. Get him from what he's worth. So obviously, Bailey Zappi is not the guy. Obviously, Malik Cunningham is not the guy. Clearly, it is Mac Jones. Drew's in the chat. What's up, Drew? Long time no see. Welcome to the After Hours Show, man. Every Tuesday and Friday, 10 p.m. East Coast time, right here on the After Hours Show. And if you guys are, you know, looking for some decent NFL talk, Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. East Coast time, I got the camera angles going. Today, I I got off work late. I just jumped on here and bada bing, bada boom. No cameras, no special effects. But Drew says, Warning for Drac Dak to get his head out of his ass. So I am thinking you are referring to the trade that the Dallas Cowboys made for Trey Lance just a couple of days ago. So as you guys know by now, if you don't know, you have not been watching the man hour, which you should be. I have clips on it. I have a little bit of this. I have a little bit of this. But Dak Prescott's perfectly fine. Trey Lance will not be on the Dallas Cowboys active roster anytime this season, maybe like week nine, week 10. He'll be a practice squad squad player. But Brandon Renner is in the chat here, and he's a, let's finish our thought about the New England Patriots here. He says, it's a classic Belichick move to build Mac Jones' confidence. You can build the confidence all you want, Brandon. You can build this man's confidence all you want. But doesn't this hurt this team in the end? You literally have no other quarterback on the roster. You have no other quarterback on the roster. Do I need to repeat that one more time for you, Brandon? There is no quarterback on the roster. The only confidence building that Mac Jones has or needed was Bill O'Brien. Bill O'Brien was the confidence maker that Mac Jones needed. Needed a competent offensive coordinator. Needed somebody that just could pull their head out of their ass and call a decent play. Which is not Matt Patricia, by the way. The worst head coach in the NFL, the worst offensive coordinator in the NFL. I, I I still baggled or boggled, I should say, of how he got that job. Very much boggled by how he got uh, that job. But I think the confidence that Mac Jones needed was the very little playing time that he got this preseason. Because there was a game, who were the New England Patriots playing? Can you remember who they were playing? I was kind of excited to see a little bit of Mac Jones. Wasn't even suited up. Yes, he had a shoulder pads that are on, but he was clearly not playing. It was Bailey Zappy time. So I kind of got to boggle my brain a little bit here, right? Because 
many, many New England Patriots fans were screaming for Bailey Zappi to start. Many New England Patriots fans were saying Bailey Zappi is our guy. Mac Noodle Jones arm, get him out of town. What has changed in less than a year for Bailey Zappi to be cut? Not traded, not demoted, but flat out released. Flat out released, saying, we don't want you anymore. Get out of here. What do you guys think happened? Because we can speculate all we want. We can speculate that he did not have a good training camp. We can speculate that a classic Bill Belichick move, as Brandon says, build Mac Jones's confidence. If you are the only one left in the room, Brandon, Drew, everybody else out there in the chat, give me a hashtag, Man Hour Live. Be fantastic, guys. If you have a room of three and the other two players are released, does that really give you a boat of confidence? I don't know. Now, I will be breaking down the New England Patriots games tomorrow on the 10 a.m. show. They are one of the teams that we'll be breaking down tomorrow along with um, who else we got. We got the New England Patriots. We have the Denver Broncos. We have the Baltimore Ravens. And then we have the Houston Texans that we're doing tomorrow. Spoiler alert. I did have the New England Patriots as a second place AFC East team. I did. Not anymore. Especially not now. The New England Patriots guys might be a bottom feeder team now. Let me know in the chat, guys. What do you guys legitimately think that Bill Belichick is doing in New England? What is he trying to prove? Is there something else in play? Is there another big-name quarterback out there that has been released or cut that could possibly come in and make some noise? Do you think Mac Jones' job is really safe? Let me know, guys. Let me know what you think. Speaking of making 53-man roster here, guys, there's a link in the description. Okay, hang on. Brandon, Brandon, Brandon. My man says Carson Wentz. My man says Carson Wentz is going to be the ringleader in New England. Hoffy, where are you at, my man? Wayne G, where are you at? Guys, you guys are New England Patriots fans. Those are your boys. My man's saying Carson Wentz. This is the same Carson Wentz that has been released by three teams in three seasons. This is the same Carson Wentz that could not complete a 10-yard pass with, with the New England Colts or the, uh, the Indianapolis Colts. This is the same Carson Wentz that lost his job to... Jalen Hurts. I don't know. <laughs> Arthur Brown says, Hoffy is a Dolphin. No, he's not. Hoffy is whatever I tell him to be. And he's definitely not no Dolphin. <laughs> What's up, Arthur Brown? Hope you had a grand old night, man. Hope, hope you had a grand day as well. But let me bring this uh, chat up here for Drew. Guys, this is the After Hour Show. We talk about anything and everything that you want. I really don't have anything planned whatsoever. Simply shooting from the hip. This is what we do on, on the After Show. Like after show, There's a link. You guys can click that link. You can join the show. As long as you have cell phone service or internet service, you can join. Put some headphones in. Join the chat. We can have a nice little conversation right here on screen for every people to chime in and talk some shit. Let's do it. But Drew here, my brother from another mother. Drew says the reason that the Dallas Cowboys traded a fourth round pick for Trey Lance just the other day was a warning for Dak to get his head out of his ass. I guess he's asking, asking the question. 
Is it a warning for Dak to get his head out of his ass? So first things first, Drew. I don't think Dak Prescott ever had his head in his ass. I think you fans out there that want to be consistently dogging my man Dak Prescott have your heads in your asses. Over and over and over again, Dak Prescott gets reamed through the coals. Over and over and over again, it is Dak Prescott's fault that they lose in the playoffs. It is Dak Prescott's fault that he threw an interception. It is Dak Prescott's fault that Zeke Elliott gained 10 pounds. It is this. Everything's Dak Prescott's fault. But let's look at the other side of the coin here, Drew. Let's look at truly what the issue is with all you fans out there about Dak Prescott. My man, Dak Prescott, had a overrated, overpaid, underperforming offensive coordinator. There is a reason why Kellen Moore was, quote, the hottest head coach candidate year after year, but never got a interview. I take that back. He did interview bad with the Denver Broncos. It shows you how bad he interviewed because the Daniel Hackett got the job and he was the worst head coach of all time per Sean Payton. You have to understand that Dak Prescott was put in very, very bad positions. Time after time after time again. Dak Prescott is a game managing quarterback. Dak Prescott is is that quarterback that is great at nickeling diamond you down the field, hitting the big play when he has to or when he wants to, but he's perfectly happy throwing a Tom Brady 10-yard slant route, five-yard slant route, handing the ball off to Tony Paul Pollard, scrambling the pocket alike a little bit to extend the play to hit a hitch route. That is who Dak Prescott is. That is who Mike McCarty is making Dak Prescott to be. This year, Dak Prescott and the Dallas Cowboys will make some noise in the NFL. Dak Prescott and the Dallas Cowboys will win a playoff game this playoff season. Dak Prescott and the Dallas Cowboys will win two playoff games this NFL postseason. You guys will understand that Dak is not that guy, right? But he is a guy. He is Alex Smith. He is Tom Brady. He is Jimmy G. He is Derek Carr. He will not lose you a lot of games if they're put in the correct positions. Mike McCarty will put Dak Prescott in the, doc in the correct positions. Mike McCarty will win a lot of games with the Dallas Cowboys this season. Arthur Brown coming out with the shot says, warning, Buck is a Cowboys fan. I am a Cowboys fan. How can you not be a fan of America's team? I mean, if you love America, you love the Dallas Cowboys. If you don't love America, you don't love Dallas Cowboys. I wish Stephen A. had his... No oh, Arthur, I know you have never heard me rant about Stephen A. I strongly, strongly dislike this guy's persona that he plays on TV. I strongly dislike everything Stephen A. Stands Smith stands for on first take. I dislike everything Stephen A. stands for on ESPN. Now, obviously, I think he plays a character on TV. However, there are only so many things that you can act. There are so many things that you can portray. There are only so many things that you can say, hey, 
is just a persona. And I can see through the bullshit nine times out of ten, but Stephen A pisses me off. I hope Stephen A stubs his pinky toe every morning when he wakes up on the couch. <laughs> Brandon says, I am predicting the Bengals Cowboys Super Bowl with the Bengals winning it. I like that bold statement, Brandon. Brandon, kick, click that link. I would like you to join. I, I want you to tell me what about these two teams that make you think that they are Super Bowl caliber teams. Now, I do think the NFC is wide open. You can tell me probably any NFC team. I, like, I can get behind that. I could, I, could, I could get behind the Philadelphia Eagles. I can get behind the 49ers. I can get behind the Seahawks. I can get behind the Detroit Lions, the Green Bay Packers, Minnesota Vikings. I can get behind pretty much anybody in the NFC, except for the Arizona Cardinals, Rams, Commanders, um, you know, Raiders, Broncos, Chargers. <laughs> Those are AFC teams, obviously, but you, you guys get it. Now, the Bengals. They have, they have the potential. They do have the potential, but we have to know that the ASC is so freaking loaded. I feel whoever gets the first seed in the AFC will make the Super Bowl this year. Because the ASC does have a lot of po good late season games. Well, we see the uh, Bengals Chiefs play week 18. We see the... Um, Jets, Bills play week 18. There are going to be a lot of beat-up teams going into the playoffs, so that bye week is going to be so beneficial to whatever team that makes it. Now, if the Bengals get the first overall seed, I can get behind you with, with like just like with that. The Bills get the first overall seed, give me some Bills. I feel like whoever gets that first overall seed is going to have a nice, easier <laughs> road to the Super Bowl. But I'd be curious, like, what makes you think that the Bengals have improved that much better than last season? Yes, I do know they added um, Orlando Brown Jr. from my Kansas City Chiefs to that offensive line. A great move, great steal, right? Um, a year under um, Zach Taylor's offense with Joe Burrow and – uh, Mixon and Boyd and Higgins and Chase and all those boys, right? However, just because you have two really good offensive linemen, the offensive line still pretty much sucks. I don't want to be, you know, ringing that cowbell, but but besides Jonah Williams, the right tackle, and or and or or and Orlando Brown Jr., the left tackle, the interior. It's kind of shitty. And Chris Jones is going to be fresh. Yes, Chris Jones might miss week one with the Kansas City Chiefs. Yes, Chris Jones might miss week two. Week three. Hell, he may not even play till week nine. But you know what? The playoffs don't start till week 19. My man's got 10 weeks to get in shape, and he's going to be healthy. He's going to be hungry. And the Bengals interior offensive line sucks. Chris Jones is going to be fresh. Look out, baby. Joe Bro, you better have a nice little insurance plan because my boy's coming. He coming. Let me look at the rest of the teams of the AFC. We cannot sleep, sleep on the Jets. As much as I've been dogging the Jets all offseason, I today I sit back and I watched all three or all four of their preseason games, actually. From start to finish. Now, I focused more on quarters one and two because that, you know, that's that's when more of the starters and game changer players played, 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 right? But I focused on those four games. Guys, the Chargers defense is nasty. They got a damn good defense. And their six hardest games of the season. First six weeks of the season, right? Many people have those first six week circles saying that this is make or break for the New York Jets, and that is absolutely correct. However, you guys do understand. We understand that the fact that 
defenses come around a little bit sooner than offenses do. With that being said, the Jets defense has been there. They've done that. They're coming around sooner. The offense, it might be a late bloomer for the Jets. Their offense may not click until week 9, week 10, week 11. Well, guess what? The defense has been carrying it the previous nine weeks. Don't sleep on the Jets. Oh, my God, that sounded so bad coming out of my mouth. But don't sleep on the Jets. Miami Dolphins. Yes, you guys struck out on Jonathan Taylor. Yes, you guys struck out on Delvin Cook. You still got Rasheem Mostert. You still got uh, Jeff Miller. Or, uh, uh, is it Jeff Miller? Jeff Smith? I can't remember. Jeff somebody. You, you still got two 30-year-old backs in the backfield. But still got Tyreek Hill. Still got Jalen Waddle. Might, might miss week one. But you still got him, right? Tutha, uh, Tua is healthy as of right now. You have a fairly good defense. Maybe not a top 10 defense like the Jets or the Patriots. But a pretty good, pretty good defense. But the key factor for the Miami Dolphins, backup quarterback Mike White. X factor, Mike White. He will win a couple games for the Miami Dolphins this season. He alone will win a couple games for the Miami Dolphins this season. Then we look at the AFC North. Yes, the Bengals are in the North, but let's look at the other teams. The Pittsburgh Steelers. They are the least talk about, the most underrated team out there. You guys understand how good the Pittsburgh Steelers are going to be this season? Mike Tomlin has worked wonders on Kenny Small Hands Pickett. George Pickens is going to have a breakout year. His sophomore years might be one of his best years out there. They still have a great running back, Najee Harris. Did you guys forget about him? Don't forget about him. He is going to tote the rock. He's going to get 1,800 yards this season. The other wide receiver, the number one air quotes there, Johnson, Deontay Johnson. Plus the defense, grungy defense. Then the Browns. Good grief. Can the Browns get any more stacked on offensive side of the ball? The weakest point of the Cleveland Browns might be Deshaun Watson. How does that sound coming out of the like, just like out of the mouth? The weakest link on the Cleveland Browns offense might be a former top 10 quarterback that hasn't played for two seasons. Knock that rust off. Look out. And then, as much as this hurts me to say, Lamar Jackson and the Baltimore Ravens, they got some pieces in place. They got a nice little offense working. How weird is this to say? The weakest link on the Baltimore Ravens right now is their defense. The AFC is legitimately wide open. We didn't even speak about the Jacksonville Jaguars yet. We didn't speak about the Tennessee Titans yet. Hell, we could put Davis team, team up there. The Chargers. On paper, the Chargers might be the best team in the AFC West. The Chargers might be the best team on paper in the AFC West. Better than the Raiders, better than the Broncos, better than the Chiefs. On paper. I said it last after our show, David. The Chargers' weakest link is their coach. Brandon Staley is the weakest link on their team. So, Brandon, predicting Bengals versus Cowboys Super Bowl. Went off on a little tender there. My bad. It's the after it's the after hour show. No rules. No holds bar. 
I do like your Cowboys in the Super Bowl. Not because I'm a Cowboys fan, just because I think the Cowboys are finally going to click this year. I think the Cowboys finally have everything in place. Dak Prescott, as much as Drew said, warning, get his head, head out of his ass, maybe that is what he needed. Maybe Dak needed a little bit of competition. Maybe that's what they need to get Zeke Elliott out of town. Maybe that's what they needed was a healthy Michael Gallup. I like the Dallas Cowboys. I do like the Dallas Cowboys. Cincinnati Bengals. I cannot hate the pick because they are arguably one of the best teams in the AFC. I can't love the pick because they are arguably one of the best teams in the AFC. I'm not hating you it, but I'm not praising for it either. But that would be a very interesting Super Bowl, I think. Cowboys versus Bengals Super Bowl. Very, very interesting. I kind of like it. I kind of don't. <laughs> let me let me go ahead and waffle around that. Yeah, Arthur, I was actually just talking about um, rookie David Ack. Ac- is it acne? Like the zit, like a like a uh, like a crater face, you know. I didn't know who he was. I'm going to have to watch some Miami Dolphins preseason film and watch this guy. I I don't know who he is. I didn't even know he was a rookie. I'd be curious to see how is it David Acne or is it Ac is it Ac 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 New like the, with the little abbreviation thing above the e. I'm kind of curious. Brandon says, fun fact, the Pittsburgh Steelers have only had three head coaches since 1970. Isn't that just like, was it last week, David, we were kind of like, or David and uh, and Arthur, we were talking about staple organizations, right? We were talking about the best organizations out there, and we were kind of like discussing of like what makes a great org great organization. And I think the Pittsburgh Steelers, I'm going to repeat this again. And I think that they are a model citizen of great organizations. They are a model citizen of interviewing the right way, getting their guide, not have to worry about, Oh, the Rooney rule and all this other crap. They want their guy. They go get their guy. They actually interview the guy, do this, do that, and they obviously do well. I don't re- I don't even remember who the Steelers coach was before Bill Cowher. I feel like it was a little bit before my time. But the only two Steelers coaches that I remember are Bill Cowher and then obviously Mike Tomlin. Who was the previous uh, Steelers head coach? I'd be curious about that. Spread offense all the way to the Super Bowl. David, as a Chargers fan, you know that defense wins championships. Actually, I guess as a Chargers fan, you wouldn't know that. (laughs) I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But there is a reason why teams like the Cincinnati Bengals, Buffalo Bills, Miami Dolphins, Baltimore Ravens, Dallas Cowboys, San Francisco 49ers. There is a reason why these teams have not won a Super Bowl in the last few years, 10, 20 years, right? It is because there is a such thing as a one-trick pony. Yes, Lamar Jackson, the Baltimore Ravens, have a great regular season record. Many 13-win seasons, right? 12, 13, 14-win seasons because they do one thing really, really well in the regular season. Well, when a team is worried about do or die, how are we going to win this game, get out of here on top, they take away that one thing. They say, Lamar Jackson, we're going to keep you in the pocket. We're going to force you to beat us passing. Lamar Jackson has only done that one time in his playoff career. One time. Buffalo Bills, 
They throw the ball really, really well during the regular season. A lot of 13-win seasons, right? A lot of times they're 12, 13, 14 wins. We get it. But we're going to take away the pass. We're going to play nickel. We're only going to rush three, right? Force you to run the ball. Oh, you can't? You haven't run the ball all season long? Oh, darn it. Damn the luck. You cannot be a one-trick pony. You cannot run spread offense all season long and expect to win in the playoffs. Good coaches and good teams shut down the one thing that you are good at in the playoffs. There is a reason why cream always rises to the top. There is a reason why teams like the Buffalo Bills, Baltimore Ravens, Dallas Cowboys. There is a reason why those teams do really well in the regular season, shit the bed in the, in the, in the playoffs. One-trick ponies. Also, their defense has been kind of meh. So, I know you want me to put some speak on your coach's name, but if the Chargers do well this season, let's say, guys, let's 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 just you know, kind of play the what if game here. What if the Chargers go thirteen and four this season? What if Justin Herbert wins MVP? What if the Chargers get the number one overall seed this season? Do you think all the credit is going to go to Coach Brandon Staley? Absolutely not. What acquisition did they make this offseason? Offensive coordinator, Kellen Moore. Do you guys remember when the Dallas Cowboys were a 13-win team? Before Mike McCarty got there, I believe Jason Garrett was still the head coach. The, Cow the Dallas Cowboys offense was all over the field, putting up 500-yard games, scoring 30-plus points a game. It was all Kellen Moore. Jason Garrett got little credit. But once the things start to happen, once the things start to shit the bed, oh, Jason Garrett's fault. It can't be Kellen Moore's fault, little golden dream boy over here. If the Chargers go 13-4, first overall seed, MVP Justin Herbert. All the credit's going to go to Kevin Moore. Sorry, David. It is what it is. For whatever reason, Kevin Moore is a little golden boy in the NFL. He can do nothing wrong. He's just not very good. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just, I don't like Kevin Moore. Never have, never will, for whatever reason. Arthur Brown. Let me give me that. <laughs> First of all, I, I see Rick, Rick Flair. So I've, I got to get my alligator boots under control over at like, like, like over here, right? He says, the only problem that Dallas still has Philadelphia in their division. Like Ric Flair says, to be the man, you got to beat the man. So, Arthur Brown, as I do agree with that quote, one of the quotes that I have lived by my entire life, to be the man, you got to beat the man. 100%. My daddy taught me that long, long time ago. That's when I whoop, whooped his ass. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I have never met anybody that has legitimately beat up their dad because anytime a kid challenges their dad, the grown man strength comes out and the, there's a daddy whoop down getting ready to happen. But with that being said, Super Bowl hangover is real. Super Bowl hangover is real. With that being said, the Philadelphia Eagles are going to struggle this season. They do have an easier schedule. I was expecting them to have a super hard schedule, but their schedule seems kind of be fairly favorable, right? But there is a team in the NFC East that I am more worried about as a Cowboys fan than the Philadelphia Eagles. There is a team out there that has been quietly making some really, really good moves. There is a team out there 
that has a running back on a one-year deal. There's a team out there that signed their quarterback to a pretty lucrative deal. There's a team out there that just signed one of the steals of this offseason in Isaiah Simmons for a seventh-round draft pick. And that is the New York football Giants. Do you guys understand that this offseason, the New York Giants literally fixed every hole that they had on their offense? Literally fixed every hole that they had on their defense. Guys, the Giants are coming. The Giants are going to be the team to beat in the NFC East this season. You guys might be laughing now. You might be thinking, what is Buck drinking over there tonight? I'm drinking Bud Light. I've had a long day. But the simple fact of the matter is that the New York Giants have the best defense in the NFC East. Better than the Cowboys. Better than the Eagles. Better than the Commanders. Did you guys forget about the man shot out there? Kevin on bro. Watch those guys' highlights. I believe they were playing the New York Jets. This man takes a straight right arm into a grown man's chest, throws him back eight yards, throws him down, and sacks Zach Wilson in three steps. And then you add Isaiah Simmons to that. Guys, the New York Giants are a team not to be slept on. Do not sleep on the Giants. Arthur Brown says, do not sleep on the Commanders as well. This is the reason why I'm going to be sleeping on the Commanders, Arthur Brown. I do like Scary Terry. I do like that they have finally named Sam Howell the quarterback. However, the defense kind of has me like an eh, right? Uh, Chase Young. A couple years ago, this guy was good. Really good. Then he tears his, FC, eh, tears, his, tears his ACL. Comes back this season. Got a stinger in practice. A little stinger. Back in my day, we'd shake it off in the snow, right? Rub, rub some dirt on him, call it a day. This man has missed three weeks with a stinger. A stinger. And let's not forget that just a month ago, was it after week one preseason? The offensive players were saying that Eric, Eric Bianini was too hard on him. I, I'm not, I'm not lying. They legitimately said that Eric B is being too hard on him. He's bringing the wrong culture to town or something to that effect. I will post a blog again up on our Facebook page. If you guys are curious about it, you guys wanted Eric B to come in to change the culture. You wanted EB to come in there to win you a Super Bowl to give you the best offense in the league. And now you're complaining about it? The man's too rough on it? The man's too hard on us? What? That is the reason why I do not like the Washington Commanders this season. It takes time to build a culture. It takes time to right the ship. In many high schools and colleges, you know, it takes about two, three years to get your guys to buy into the system. If you're successful, it might take a little bit faster, right? In the NFL, yes, there is a new ownership in Washington, D.C. They still got the same head coach there in Ron Rivera. Now, I don't like to speak ill will on anybody whatsoever that I'm trying to change my ways. I'm trying to put some good out in the world, right? But unfortunately, Ron Rivera kind of has a pass the next couple of years because of the passing of his wife. 
I know that it's it's not politically correct to say that, but that is the truth. The ownership, the general manager, whatever, is giving Ron Rivera a couple years to kind of figure him, himself out because the passing of his wife. That is probably why he still has a job in Washington. That is probably why he wasn't fired last season when he didn't even know that they'd been eliminated from, from, from the playoffs. Obviously, his head was not in it. I understand losing of your wife has got to be tough. I couldn't imagine. I couldn't imagine not having my other half right by my side. I can't imagine life with, like, with, like, with, with, without it. But he got a pass, just to be honest. It's a winning culture, he says, Arthur Brown says. Arthur Brown says, that's why Washington can't win. They're a bunch of pansies. Some teams are comfortable losing. You know, a wise coach once told me, I believe I was, it was my freshman year, Juco College, Fort Scott Community College, go Greyhounds. My defensive coordinator, or he wasn't my defensive coordinator. He was like an assistant defensive coordinator. He was like our conditioning coach, right? He was a ex drill sergeant. He MF'd you any chance he could get. And it was very, very degrading. I did not like it one bit. But the one thing that he's told me that always stuck with me still to this day is that you have to hate losing more than you like winning. Let me repeat that. You have to hate losing more than you like winning. So once Washington commanders or any team in general hates losing more than they enjoy winning, that is when the winning culture starts to happen. That is when a team could get turned around. That is when your life can get turned around. I don't want to go down a life rabbit hole by like any means, but if you are tired of getting shit on time after time at work and life on social media or whatever, start hate losing more than you enjoy winning. That has always stuck with me, and that is how I lived my life by still to this day. David says, Arthur Brown, too, true spit. They will be good whenever Magic Dawson goes to Cess follows. Isn't uh, Magic Johnson the owner of the Dodgers as well? I believe the Dodgers are not doing very well. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not. I haven't been following baseball as much as I usually do. But can we really say that Magic Johnson is the win all, be all type of person? Because the truth of the matter is, is like when he when his owner group, right, bought the Dodgers in baseball, you can just buy success, to be honest. You you can just buy success. And then he, he is the, uh, is he the owner of the Clippers? Is that, is, is that, is, is that what he owns right now? Or I can't, I thought he owned a basketball team, a team as well, but I, I don't know. It is what it is. David says, real spit on that quote, Buck. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I some Sometimes, if you guys just listen, I got some good stuff that come out of my mouth. Normally, I just, I just don't put myself on that platform to be that motivational speaker type of person. Normally, I save that for my kids. But if you guys like that stuff, I mean, I can bring it. I can bring anything that you guys want. Oh, right here. I missed that one. Yes, the Dodgers have won the division just seven state straight years. Congratulations. How many of the championships have they won? <laughs> Magic Bronson just brings his money. He does nothing. He doesn't know anything about football or baseball. This is very, very true. So there are owners. So we're going to talk about this, and, and then, guys, we're going to wrap it up. I promise wife will watch Hard Knocks tonight, uh, ep like episode three. So there are owners out there that are just strictly out there for the business side of things, right? 
I was listening to a 30 for 30 podcast when I was flying down to Atlanta a couple years ago for, for like work. And, um, it was when, uh, the Clippers owner bought the team and then David or then Dr. Bus wanted the Lakers, right? He just, he wanted the fame. He wanted the fortune. He, he, he wanted the notor- the notoriety of owning the LA Lakers. Now there are people out there like owners, like Jerry Jones that played football that has, you know, earned his money and earned the right to buy a team. And that's why he's so hands-on people like kind of talk down on Jerry Jones for being an active owner. So would you rather have a owner that wants to be a part of the success that wants to help to build the brand that wants to help to, you know, make your franchise, the most valuable franchise ass out there, like the Dallas Cowboys, or do you want an owner like magic Johnson that says here, Take, 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 take this money and I'm going to flip it and make more money and do what you got to do. Like I, I want a hands on owner. I want an owner that is willing to go through the grind with me. I want an owner that is out there on the sidelines in 110 degree heat watching practice. I want an owner that sees where all their money's going. I bet you the only time we see Magic Johnson out there is on Sunday afternoons up in the press box. Are, are we going to see him down there in the snow and the rain and the wind on the sideline? We see Jerry Jones there. We also see him see him up in the box. But at the same time, like I want to honor that is hands on. He played, and he was a fan of the Cowboys before he bought them. So that's why he's so passionate about the boys. And people dog him about his passion. You 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 cannot dog somebody for being passionate about something that they own. Arthur Brown, let's say you bought a brand new 2024 F-150 right off the lot, $137,000, right? You are proud of that. You are proud of that truck. You worked your ass off for that truck. You were out there waxing your truck on Saturday afternoon. You're like, damn birds, get your bird shit off like off here. You're consistently washing it, parking it in the garage, detailing it. Are people dogging you about that for taking care of your baby? Are the people out there dogging you for taking care of what you worked your ass off for, but they want to dog Jerry Jones about what he worked his ass off for working in the oil fields and owning an oil field and selling it and then buying the Dallas Cowboys. There are people out there that are just giving stuff. Bears owner, Virginia McCaskey. Brandon Combs consistently talks down about her over and over and over and over again. She doesn't care about the team. She inherited it. It was given to her. She didn't work her ass off for it. She hasn't gone through the grind. She was given it. I wouldn't give a damn if they talk. He refrained about my truck reference. (laughs) But guys, that is going to be it. I'm going to go watch episode three of Hard Knocks. It's been a long day. Hope you guys enjoy this after hours. Just chill, chit-chat talk. Tuesday and Friday, guys, moving forward for the rest of the NFL season. New England Patriots, guys. (laughs) What are you guys thinking? What are you guys thinking? David, last comment before we head out. Jerry Jones is a great owner. He is a great owner, not a very good GM. Let's just put that out there. Just like Al Davis of the Raiders have not been the sin since Al Davis passed. You guys also have to realize that um, Al Davis kind of sold his soul for that Super Bowl, right? 
just like what the 49ers did in the um, early 90s or late 90s. I can't 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 remember. I'm just, I was still kind of young then. But basically, they went all in. All the money. We don't care about anything moving forward. We want to win right now. This is our year. All in, all out. And then the rest of the year, whatever happens, happens. And unfortunately, the Raiders are still kind of dealing with that. And I I have to say this about the Raiders. The Raiders have one of the most loyal fan bases out there. They have moved, what, three times in six years? And those fans are still supporting their 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 team. Now they don't have the black hole like they used to, by like any means, but they still got those guys. They still got to reach in LA. They still got to reach in Oakland. Back to LA. Back to Vegas. In a couple of years they might be in Seattle. You never know. <laughs> we'll see you guys tomorrow morning, 10 a.m. East Coast time. Right here, whatever platform you're listening to us on, live, raw, uncut sports talk. Have a good night, guys. Love you all. Peace out.